Welcome into episode 242 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined for the 200th time. That's that's crazy to, to say out loud by Bridget Prue and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, how are you guys? Good. We, we I didn't know it was our 200th until Brian brought that up uh, just before we started. But yeah, so I think people see 242. Uh, you know, it, this podcast was run by Ken Laird and Matt Kalman before us. Um, but yeah, 200 for us over what? It's going to be over two and a half seasons now just about or like two full ones yeah, yeah. I, th- I think it was around uh i think it was around right before the trade deadline when they got taylor hall so it was what was that like march of 21 something yeah like that? yeah so yeah just about two and a half years yeah, we've done a lot of episodes. <laughs> I, I kind of remember, like, I, I just figured half of those were, were Ken and Kalman. And then when Brian said it, I was like, we did 200. That's a lot. Yeah, well, God God bless you guys for putting up with me for the, for the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Bruins win 5-2 over the Sabres. Bridget and Scholars jump right into the opening shifts. Well, it was a big bounce back game for them. You know, they lose in overtime in Montreal and was a pretty sluggish effort. Jim Montgomery said after the game, he thought his team looked tired. Then they have Sunday off. They get on the ice Monday at Warrior and don't really have a good practice. And about, I don't know, 40 minutes in or so where it's sitting up there in a little media press box and all of a sudden pucks off the ice, nets off the ice, and they bag skate and do, do sprints for like the last – it wasn't that long. I'm going to say like maybe seven, eight minutes, which when you're doing sprints, you know, that feels pretty damn long. Um, but that was something that they haven't done. I don't think at all under Montgomery, unless there was maybe like a practice on the road where media weren't there. We couldn't really think of any. So uh, certainly a rare occurrence for them. And the clear message was like, Hey, do you guys, need to be better. Like we just, you know, got to pick it up, got to be more focused. Didn't like seeing a bad practice after a bad game. And Bruins responded in a big way with a dominant win over the Sabres. And like a really quick start. That was, that was probably their fastest start to the year. Um, Just looking like they had their energy from the very first shift of the game. So, I, I mean, I guess it worked. It is very odd for sprints. At practice, we don't really see that a lot. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's in miracle, but it's not something that coaches use a lot in practice. So um, my opening shift, is it has to do with a lot of first goals for people in the game against Buffalo. So first of all, Hampus Lindholm and Brennan Carlo got their first goals of the season. Oscar Steen had his first goal of the season, and so did Dan Heinen. So a lot of guys getting in on the scoring, a pretty high-scoring game and a lot of firsts. I mean, and then obviously there's Pasternak's 11th, but <laughs> everybody else, it was their first goal. Yeah. And, and as I said to you guys, before we started recording until it's no longer a story, I think the story for this team is just the keyword regular season run that they've been on dating back to the beginning of last season. I mean, I think this point might be a little bit more in your face if I gave it three more games to do, 100 game sample size, but I'm going to do the last 97 games for the team 77, 13, and 7. I'm just going to let that sit there. We can jump back to that. It's just, it's objectively very, very impressive. I know what happened last spring, and I know that until they have a chance to rectify that in the spring of 24, the, the easy narrative is going to be it doesn't matter because it's not the playoffs. We've talked about in the past, that's not entirely the case obviously you have to get to the playoffs and there's other benefits to having a strong regular season and being ahead of the pack that they are uh in the way that they are but just the last you know season plus with this team regular season wise 77 13 and 7 that doesn't really happen yeah and obviously they still have the best record in the league this year now at 12 1 and 2 but i think you know all they can do at this point is bank points and build their game. Like you, you can't avenge last spring yet. You can't do that until you get to the playoffs. So, um, 
you know, all you can do now is take steps to get ready for that. And to that end, I think the way they won and the way they responded Tuesday was important because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I asked Montgomery on Monday about five on five offense and, you know, what they had to do to, to get better there. Um, because it, it, it is clearly like the area that, you know, if you're going to pinpoint any weakness, that's where they're middle of the pack. The power play had started picking it up in recent games and, and scored another goal on Mon- on uh, Tuesday. Um, but the five of five offense has really kind of been up and down. And after a quiet night in Montreal, bounces back, they get three five on five goals, a four and four goal and a power play goal. Um, but, you know, at, I thought, Every line kind of had chances. You see, we had talked about that Hein and Patrick DeBrusque line, you know, doing some good things, but not scoring yet. They score. Um, Marsh and Zaka Pasternak continue uh, to do their thing. Another goal for the fourth line um, with Oscar Steen getting his first of the season. So this was like the exactly the kind of like get back, get right back on track game that you needed especially now going into four days until their next game on Saturday. Like that, that would suck having this many days off. If you followed up the Montreal loss with, you know, another rough game where your effort wasn't or your compete level or whatever wasn't really there. And not, not to mention another game where there was some, even though it wasn't very close game, there was a lot of, uh, are not a lot of, but there was at least uh, one situation where you can think of that things got heated and physical and there was a bit of a brawl. Uh, Cousins throws down pasta. Marshawn was involved. McAvoy gets a penalty. Um, it was, you know, it, it was as close to a line brawl as we've seen in a while that nobody dropped the gloves, but everybody was involved in that scrum. And I didn't know if you guys had any thoughts on that. That happened pretty early in the game, but um yeah things got physical uh it was a pretty entertaining first period things slowed down a little bit as as the game went on but that's because it was such a big lead it was four to nothing after the first period so um yeah I didn't know if you guys had thoughts on that the physicality of the game in particular that that brawl and cousins uh who by the way I think we brought this up last uh last podcast we thought maybe it was an, we didn't look it up, but that maybe it was an extra penalty if you decide to drop the gloves when you have a full, like you have a bubble or a cage on <laughs> and Cousins was wearing the bubble and he decided he was just going to throw a pasta on the ice. So I don't know what you guys thought. Well, I didn't love seeing uh, Pasternak going, going down like that, especially without um, having somebody on the Bruins kind of step in there and, also, Not, his helmet, his helmet had gotten pulled off too. So, like, he was going down to the ice with no helmet on, which is scary. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that comes to your mind is like, you know, does that happen if Lucic is has a presence in the game? Maybe it does. You know, things happen quick, and if Lucic is on the bench, I'm I'm not saying Cousins doesn't still do that, but you know, I I, I appreciate uh, McAvoy and, and Pasternak and Zaka. And I think Laura was out there, like, obviously stepping in in the first place and sticking up for Marshand, but you can't, you, you can't really do it half ass. Like that's kind of how you get hurt. Right. Like, I feel like, like passionate kind of goes in there and pretends like he wants to do something, but really at the end of the day, isn't going to do anything and kind of just like sense that cousins was there. And I just feel like if, if you're going to jump in and protect your teammate, you, no matter who you are, you kind of have to commit or else you, you can, be vulnerable to actually getting hurt where when you know what I'm trying to say, if you're not fully committed to the scrum. And um, so I, I liked seeing everybody jump in, but then it's like, well, don't just sit there and let somebody take you down. Like, you know, actually mean it. Right. And so, yeah, Lucci isn't in the lineup to really rectify that afterwards. Frederick is, but I guess the way I thought about it was good to see them stick up for each other, but you know, don't let yourself get hurt. And by, and, and doing that is by not kind of just standing around and being a little more active if you're going to jump in. Yeah, it was like he thought the scrum was over because him and McAvoy jumping in with Darlene, like they were all kind of tied up and nothing was happening. And 
Cousins obviously was not done with the scrum and comes in and and I, like I don't even blame Cousins because it was kind of two on one on Darlene. So you know, Cousin like yeah, it starts with you know Pasenak and McAvoy sticking from Marshand, which by the way, like the original hit was clean too. It was just it was just a solid reverse hit. There was nothing there's nothing dirty there. Um, but yeah, then if you're Cousins, you're seeing Darlene, you know, your best player uh basically getting double teams. So I I don't blame him for jumping in either. Um but yeah it's I it seemed like if that had if it had been maybe a close game you might have seen temperature temperatures rise a little more. Um because certainly it, it was there early on. But once it starts turning to three nothing, four nothing, it's like unless the Sabres are gonna goon it up, there's really not anything that's gonna happen at that point. And, you know, I don't think the Sabres are really that kind of team. Like, they can play physical, but they're not going to, you know, run around trying to take guys out. Yeah. At that point, it was 2 nothing, So it wasn't, like, super off. But then as the rest of the period went on, it was, like, retaliation didn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, it kind of just – you could see the body language on the bench, too, a lot during the rest of the game where things were just kind of a little bit defeated looking on the Sabres side. and. They were getting booed by their own fan base, which just as a person who likes watching hockey, I, I, I don't like when fan bases boo their own teams. Um, and I don't feel like it it helps anything. I don't know. I think that it happens a lot in Canada. Like I saw the Ottawa Senators were getting booed by I, their own fan I thought you were gonna say in Gillette's I thought you were gonna say in Gillette Stadium. Uh that happens. Um that I I might have booed the Patriots in Germany if I spent that much money and went over there. But um, on a normal day, I say booing your fan base is kind of a bad look because then when things turn around and you're cheering again, it's like, well, all right. To, I, I hear what you're saying, but I will say I feel like Buffalo's an exception because they've been hoping to turn around and rebuild since they drafted Jack Eichel back in 2015, and they haven't made the playoffs since 2011 so you're talking 12 years and when they were Jack Eichel right exactly but this as it pertains to the Sabres even with Eichel moving on they they, they iced a really solid young up-and-coming team last year that missed the playoffs by a point and you look at an you you look at an Atlantic division this year where Tampa Bay is very much like not Tampa Bay anymore. As at least I know they're without Vasilevsky, but you know they're six, five, and four. And you can say what you want about you know the the four being an overtime loss. But if if you look at it, just wins and losses, you know they're six and nine. Um, nice. <laughs> um, you know Montreal. My point is like Buffalo is they got fifteen points. They're second to last in the in the um, in the division and. If I'm a Sabres fan, it's like you're supposed to be going up and up. So I – and it's more of the same. It's shit coverage, bad defense. Um, I'd boo them, honestly. It, it's – does it help them, Bridget, to your point? I don't know, but it's like – if I'm a Sabres fan, it's like, yo, this has been a this has been a, a dozen years of this nonsense at this point. Yeah, I, I really have no problem with fans booing. It, I guess depending on the situation – like – there's certain times where you come across as spoiled, but look, fans pay a lot of money to go to games. And if the product on the ice or the field or wherever isn't satisfactory, like I don't mind it because it's, yeah, maybe it seems a little mean to players, but it's oftentimes just as much a message to like the organization that this isn't acceptable. And to Brian's point, like, the next step for Buffalo had to be improving defense and committing more to defense because last year they were a great offensive team and a terrible defensive team. And that ultimately is why they missed the playoffs. And they, they really just didn't improve their defense enough. Like, sorry, but signing Connor Clifton and 35 year old Eric Johnson isn't, that doesn't really move the needle too very much. So, um, and it hasn't. And, one other, just one other thing to note on the Sabres side of things, like in terms of not helping this remain a close game, 
Tage Thompson leaves with an injury. First, first in the first period, then he tried to come back in the second for a couple shifts and then left for good. Um, I I did see that Don Granado after the game, the Sabres coach, said that it, uh, he's expected to miss significant time. So that is really not going to help matters for the Sabres. Um, you know, it's it's early, but like that kind of feels like the something that can lead to the season already slipping away way for them and being yet another non-playoff year. And, and what's tricky too, is like when you had such an offensively strong season last year, it's like, you would think that when you have Darlene and Owen power, like two former number one overall draft picks as your defensive stalwarts back there, obviously there is work to be done in their game defensively, but they are defensemen. Right. So it's like, did they misidentify like, if you're trying to build your back end, like, you know, if you're a Sabres fan, it's like, well, we did draft two first overall defensemen. Like what, why is our defense so bad is what I'm, is what I'm trying to get at. So it's just like, they can't win for losing. Yeah. And also you have Devin Levi, who is the best college hockey goaltender for the last two years that gets chased in the second period. So um, also just to, uh, just to go back on something Scott said, uh, you know how much Sabres blues tickets. Oh, this is apathy. Okay. Looking at the tickets for the <laughs> looking at the tickets for the Sabres. Apparently, uh, if you want to go to the Sabres at Blues game, you can go for eight dollars. If you want to go to St. Louis, uh, if that's enticing. Uh, the next Sabres game is Penguins at at home. Is Penguins at Sabres sixty one dollars? Do you think? Do you um, think the um? Do you think the anthem singer will correctly sing "O Canada" next time? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you guys caught that. Well, no, um, I missed this. No, I, I didn't. Well, so first of all, first of all, I don't know why. I know, I know how close Buffalo is to to the Canadian border, so I get it. But you know, as as people know, you usually only play the Canadian national anthem in an American arena if there's a Canadian visiting team. Uh, last time I checked, Boston's in the U.S., uh, one of the first U.S. cities. Matter of fact, I'm um, a history buff, and um, yeah, the, uh, the the anthem singer he just you know, he, he messed up the, the lyrics to O Canada and it kind of was making its circuits around Twitter. Well, t- Todd Angeli accidentally started singing the Star Spangled Banner when, uh, but it wasn't his fault. That was um, not his fault. That the was the organist, organist's fault. Uh, wrong poster started playing the wrong anthem and he went into it and he started singing the wrong one and they're like, redo. <laughs> Real quick. Every, every time the Bruins host a Canadian team now, I like wait nervously, mostly because it's not until they start playing the anthems that are like line up for the anthems that I think like, Oh yeah, we're going to hear Oh Canada tonight. Cause like, I don't think about it ahead of time. So then I'm like, Oh, oh I man, I hope, I'm like, I, I hope stand for this. I hope they remember. Yeah. Well, I love the Canadian, the, the French Canadian version of Oh Canada. That's the best version. But, um, but yeah. And, and by the way, Buffalo was by no means sold out looking against the Bruins. I, uh, it was, I don't know how much it was sold out, but there was a lot of empty seats and that was even including the 100 people that Johnny Beecher brought to the game. So it was still pretty empty, even though he brought the entire uh, town of Elmira, New York into the stadium. It's a shame too. It's like Buffalo is such a good hockey market. Like I remember, I remember, I want to say it was 2007, 2008 season. It was the first year the Bruins made the playoffs um, under Claude and Claude's first year as coach. Uh, and that was like, that was kind of like during the era where Buffalo was a really strong team in the Eastern Conference. And I remember I went to a game in Boston against the Sabres. And anytime they the Sabres came to Boston on TV, like you always would see like, you know, the the Buffa Slug jerseys like all on the balcony. Like they traveled pretty well. Um, obviously it's a great fan base. I think nationally the Buffalo does the best um hockey ratings um so to have a team just not make the playoffs for 12 years I mean that kind of sucks for that market well it, and it's also a reminder of like no market can take their fans for granted because if if you suck like people will stop showing up and you know you, you see it in Buffalo you see it in Winnipeg you know had half empty buildings early this season. I don't know if they still are, Um, but it's like, you know, I I remember when Winnipeg got a team back, it was like, everyone's just like, 
they'll never not sell out a game. Like their building's a little smaller Winnipeg, than, than average, anyways. And and it's like, uh, okay, yeah, well, if they're if they're not going to be competitive for years on end, even in even in Canada, like people will will stop going. Even in Buffalo, which to your point was like one of the best hockey markets there was. And you know, I think it's also it's kind of why, like when we talk about the Bruins, it's like this is why ownership and management never wanted to go the rebuild route. Like this is why they want to always be competitive because we've seen it in Boston too. Like I remember 06, 07 when the garden was, I don't know, maybe two thirds full, maybe not even that sometimes like, you know, if, if you don't have a, and it's not, it has nothing to do with like fair weather fans. It's just people aren't going to spend their money if the team's, not competitive and especially in Buffalo where it's been like this for over a decade. Yeah. I remember like my junior high days, it's like the patented, like I'd get home from hockey practice or whatever. And, and the Nesson broadcast, I would just hear Dale's voice be like, welcome into the TD bank North garden. And it would just be like, you know, all you would just see all the yellow seats, like literally in the, in, like, I remember distinctly like, you would start to see like sometimes in like those couple of years after the lockout, like Oh five Oh six and Oh six Oh seven, like the Bruins were like, they weren't completely out of it by like Christmas. They were kind of hanging around like the 10th seed, ninth seed in the East. And then the calendar would flip and they'd, they'd fall behind. But like, you would notice like the seats were just all yellow. And then like maybe in the third period, you start to see like the lower bowl start to fill up more. Cause maybe people come down from the balcony and whatever. And you know, but that was like the post Joe Thornton, like maybe Chara Savard just got there era. It was, and you had the lockout in 04, 05, and that kind of hindered, you know, whatever. But yeah, it's don't take it for granted for sure. Yeah. Like you mentioned, the Jets, that's who the Sabres play next. And it's $26 for tickets in Winnipeg. I mean, that's, that's very cheap, though. Nothing, nothing sticks out as much as, the St. Louis one. I tell you, if the if the Bruins, I haven't seen a, a hockey ticket for eight dollars in a long time. I can promise you, if the Bruins end up sucking, uh, the Jacobs will not lower ticket prices. They'll probably try to flip it and sell it. Like, come see your own private Bruins game for, for like. <laughs> so just one person pays twenty thousand yeah. dollars. They, the whole they try to spin it like it's an exclusive, like personalized experience. Yeah, like, like how you can like rent out a whole movie theater now. You just rent out the garden. The Bruins and Canadians are playing for you at TD Garden. <laughs> I have had a whole movie theater to myself before, so that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, they That's could funny. they could sell it that way. I, I have, but without even renting it. I've just I've gone to afternoon movies where no um, one else was there. Same. I went on a date where it was just the two of us and nobody else. In the I thought you were gonna say. Time. I thought you were gonna say you went on a date where it was just you, and I was like, <laughs> no. that, "That's a hell of a date." No. Oh boy. No, I, I, this is my fault. I've derailed this like ten minutes ago. Um, anyway, uh, there's, one, there's one thing that we talked about last episode that I feel is very relevant to bring back up before we get off the rails again. Um, which is we had a segment about DeBrusque and Lindholm and someone calling their starts unacceptable stats wise um, and Lindholm scores and DeBrusque, I thought had another good game. So uh, just kind of to take off, to begin where we left off last time, guys, um, does this change anything about your thoughts on that conversation? No, because I was, you know, I wasn't really worried in the first place. And DeBrus doesn't get a point Tuesday night, but helps make Heinen, Heinen's goal happen. Um, you know, he he goes in on the four check, wins the puck, and then from there, it's just it, it, all five guys on the ice, just great offensive zone possession. You know, Padra kind of wheeling around the zone. Lorai makes a nice move to step around a forward. And then McAvoy, you know, kind of moving down and taking the shot and Heinen being in the right spot for the rebound. And I do think, you know, it, we touched on it, but, like, nice to see that line get a goal because they had done some good things um, but had not yet scored. They also haven't given up a goal, so that's good. But, um, 
yeah, so, you know, they end up getting this goal, Heinen's first of the season. And DeBrusque was a big part of that, and I thought he played well besides that, even right down to the wire, the Sabres get a power play late in the third. Game's out of reach. It's 5-2. to two, And DeBrusque is killing hard. Like, he's working on the PK and um, wins a couple battles there, too. So, yeah, I thought it was a good game from for him. And Lindholm, yeah, I just think getting a goal probably helps. Just being involved offensively helps. We've talked about how no matter what he's doing defensively, um, at some point you need him to contribute on the score sheet. So, uh, you know, good shot through traffic. Levi doesn't get down quick enough because he can't really see it. So, but that's, that's what the Bruins have to do. Like they have, you know, that was on the power play, but just in general, they need their defensemen shooting more. They need their defensemen getting more shots on net, being more involved offensively. That was another thing I asked Montgomery about on Monday. And he said, like, you know, yeah, they have to be more shot ready, but also part of it is we just need to be in the offensive zone more. You know, we have to hold on to pucks and set up ozone possessions for our defensemen to activate. So I thought you saw more of that, especially as the Bruins kept building the lead. Um, you know, once they got up, once they're up five, nothing, you could see some let up, which is only natural. And, you know, Sabres get some more zone time at that point, but um, yeah, good, good game for both of them. And, and obviously for Lindholm to get on the score sheet. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll echo everything Scott just said. Um, not much more to add. The only thing I'll say on DeBrusque is uh, I'm not, you know, the question last episode and we put it out there, I think, on on uh, Twitter was, "Are you worried about Jake DeBrusker?" And uh, and I'm I'm not. Do I love his game 100 percent of the time? No, I don't love everybody's game 100 percent of the time. But for me, I'm not worried about him. I think the production will come. The only thing I'm worried about for him is his psyche, um, because you can kind of see it on his face, like throughout the game between whistles and whatnot you can tell he's pressing. He's pressing the score and he's getting frustrated with himself that he's not producing um, more offense on the score sheet. I think that's only natural for a scorer to feel that way. Um, so I just think he's wearing it a little bit. And that's the only thing I'm worried about is making sure that he is mentally just, you know, in a good place, though he's not scoring. Um, and I think the only, you know, the only way to, to really change that is to eventually have a break go your way and, and go from there. I think until he kind of gets a couple in the back of the net, I think he's probably going to wear it a little bit. And then once he finally breaks through, I'm sure you'll see him uh, a, a bit of a different demeanor. I think too, like a lot of the times you, if you're just looking at the stats, you're completely missing some of the other important things that he brings. Like he, he can win battles along the boards. He is a good four checker. He's a good penalty killer. He's on your second power play unit. He gets a lot of ice time. Scott brought that up last time. Um, and sometimes you're not the person who's the most wide open to shoot. So you pass it. And, you know, sometimes your, your lane to shoot isn't there. So the play continues and extends. And the right thing to do isn't to shoot it and to try to get your, your pad your stats. It's to be a team player and to make the right play at the right time. And that's just what the game dictates that you do. So it's not always going to be there for you uh, to just have explosive numbers. Uh, so that's, that's just what I would say about that. And then I'm, I pulled up the uh, Twitter poll that we did. Um, are you worried about Jake Rusk? 69% said, no, he'll be fine. Scott. What? What do you mean? What Scott for, for, <laughs> two, for two years, you haven't wasted a second saying nice. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. Including earlier in this episode. <laughs> but yes. No, we're not even going to say it this time. All right. I'll say it. Nice. 61% yeah. people say he'll be fine. 31% say he's not playing well. So that's, I mean. Yeah. And, and Bridget, yeah, you're, you're right. And, you know, that's a lot of like what I wrote about Sunday is he's still doing other things well. But also to Brian's point, like, and DeBrus said this on Monday, you know, he he's a, he will always see himself as a scorer. So when he's not scoring, like, yeah, it's hard not to, you know, to be upset about it. And he said, like, no one hates this 
more than I do. And then you add into that, it, it is a contract year for him. And no matter, you know, it's easy for the Bruins to, in Montgomery and front office and whoever, sit there and say, like, hey, look, as long as you continue to help us win games in other ways, we're happy with it. Like, you know, don't don't start cheating for offense. Like, that's great, and that's obviously what they should say, and it's how DeBrus should approach it. But ultimately, like, how many goals and points he has is going to play a big role in what his next contract looks like. That's just the nature of the business. So, you know, if he has – if he had a 40 goal season this year, he's looking at six and a half, seven, maybe more million dollars a year. If he has 15 goals this year, the Bruins probably say, well, I don't know. Do you really deserve any sort of raise over what you're already making right now? Like, so it matters in that way too. And, um, you know, and I asked abruptly about the, it being a contract year on Monday. And he, you know, he said like, I'm not in any position to think about that right now, but like, it's, you know, it's hard not like, obviously you're aware of it. So it's hard not to have it into your mind at times. And, um, you know, again, like that's, that's natural. And I think it's still early enough in the season that he can and should believe that like the breakthroughs coming. Um, but, you know, like Brian asked on the last episode, you know, what happens if, if it's still like this come, you know, whatever it was, January or whenever. And it's like, yeah, that would be a legitimate question, not just, like, what do the Bruins do at that point, but also, like, where is DeBrusque mentally at that point if he's still not scoring the way that he expects? So um, right now I think he's still mostly doing the right things. Montgomery acknowledged he sees, you know, a little slippage at times, but obviously not enough to affect his ice time. Um, but yeah, it'll, everyone will just feel a lot better if, you know, he, he scores three goals over the next week and a half or whatever. Yeah. I think if you're, if you're DeBrusque, you're probably looking at your stat sheet and through 13 games, instead of one goal and four assists, he'd probably prefer that he had, you know, realistically like, you know, five or six goals and maybe six or seven assists for around 13, 14, 15 points as opposed to where he is. And I think that when people say, don't worry about him, he's doing all the little things right. I mean, okay. But as we just mentioned, when you're paid to be a scorer, that, that mentality, that holding the stick, that's real, right? The pressure starts to compile internally and um, between the years. And that's just the reality of things. That's why it is important for a scorer to score even when they're doing little things right. And, and one of the main reasons we said we're not worried is because if he plays the way he's been playing, it's just a matter of time. And that line did score today, and it it wasn't him that put it in, but he worked really hard on that shift. And it does feel like that line is getting there, and it is just a matter of time for him. So um, he, if you keep doing the right things, right, things will even out. Obviously, Scott, you're the advanced stats guy. Um, usually you have some sort of stat to, to bear out what you're seeing, uh, you know, high danger chances or expected goals for, or, you know, all of that nice stuff. But I'm sure you put some of that in your article because you always back yourself up with, uh, the best stats. Yeah. He goes, I mean, into, his... he goes into a fight and his knife is just like a natural stat trick stat, like. Here's my advanced analytics. I'm going to stab you with it. Yeah. Like his, I mean, his shot attempts and like individual scoring chances are basically right in line with last year at five on five. It's, it's fewer overall because as we mentioned last episode, he's getting half as much power play time because he's not on the first unit. Um, the, the one area where like there's a, you know, a little bit of like a noticeable decline is his high danger chances are a little down. So it's like, and if you look at money puck tracks, like shooting distance from the net too, and he's taking shots a little further back than last year, which means like, okay, he's getting some looks, but he's not quite getting as close to the net as he did last year. So like, that would be the area where you'd say, all right, well, instead of, you know, I don't know, being around the slot, 
get right on top of the crease, like where Danton Heinen was when he scored tonight, you know, get to those areas a little more. Um, but yeah, other than that, like the, yeah, he, he is getting chances, just maybe not quite as many great ones as last year. Uh, did you guys notice as the score got away from the, um, both the Bruins and the Sabres, although it was kind of out of hand before this happened, but did you, did you notice Montgomery shuffle the lines a little bit? He put Zaka between DeBrusque and Heinen and then Potra between Marshand and Pasternak. Do you think that was in an effort to maybe see what Potra looks between those two guys and maybe have Zaka give uh, DeBrusque a bit of a veteran presence and maybe an opportunity to score later in the game? I did notice that. I also noticed at times – Montgomery likes to do this. He'll like start a different center uh, on on a shift or like s- switch a center in early to play with two different wingers and then halfway through they'll sh- they'll uh, switch out and um, he, I think he does it on purpose. Sometimes it's just the flow of the game, but I think he does it on purpose to try to just get little glimpses of what pairs and, and lines can look like. And I did notice that he had Potra with Marshawn uh, trying to see what that looked like. And then we we have seen times where Pasta and Patra look good together. So um, just trying to keep the chemistry a little bit going. If you can get time late in the game to maybe reignite some chemistry there, they did have a good shift of where they had a few chances in close. And you're right, maybe Zaka helps with that veteran presence, like you mentioned, Brian, with DeBrusque. So I'm not sure... Um, Zaka gives him necessarily a huge amount more of, uh, I I guess, as I'm saying this, I'm changing my mind. Um, (laughs) Zaka is a really great playmaker, so maybe he can tee up uh, DeBrusque, and he's a very unselfish player, so maybe he, you know, maybe there is a better chance for DeBrusque scoring with Zaka there. Yeah, it might have been partly... It could have been any number of things, and we we started recording. So Montgomery did his Nesson interview. I haven't seen his like uh, press conference with with media yet, but um, I'm gonna guess he probably wasn't even asked about that because the game was so out of hand. But yeah, I mean, it could have been any number of things. It, it could have been to try to jumpstart someone or, or a couple players. It could have been just hey, here's a couple combinations I've been thinking about and you know, I wasn't going to try it when other lines were playing well and we were in a close game, but you no, know, give it a look now. Or it could have just been maybe loading up like some of your better defensive players um, just to have them out there in situations to hold on to the lead. Um, and, you know, Marsha and Patra Pasternak can be sort of the one trio that you just free up and give more offensive um, shifts too. So yeah, there could have been like a few different reasons for that, but um, I don't know. I just think Montgomery just really likes changing lines in general. Like it, I honestly think at times he just can't help himself. He's like, he's like, oh man, this game's going good. You know what I'm going to do? Gonna change up the lines. Here we go, boys. Yeah. Well, Hey, it's working for him, and to to bring it all the way back to my original take, he's got a 77-13-7 and seven record as their head coach, and obviously that dates back to last year. What is very eye-opening um, this year is that clearly there's a big difference, there's a big absence on this roster from last year, and that's Patrice Bergeron. So, um, you know, we've talked about it throughout the year, but – and Scott, you mentioned like the Bruins can't do anything about last spring until this coming spring where they have a chance to redeem themselves. And they will have that chance because of this great start. We all fully expect them to be in the postseason. Um, I guess just your guys' thoughts on on what we're watching with this team. Um, I don't really think we've seen any. I mean, obviously, the Bruins had the best record in the league uh, league's history last year. Right. So combine that with this 12 one and two start i guess i would be accurate in saying that like no one's ever done this before this this season into next season success is unprecedented based on the fact that they broke records last year and are you know 
you know, do, off to a better start this year. Yeah, they have the most points in the NHL again right now, as of right now. <laughs> so it's this, you know, we thought – and, and I will say when, when we were early on in last season and when we were in the off season, we were talking about treading water for a month or, you know, a month and a half until some of your injured players come back and they were well above treading water. They were on pace to make the playoffs. They were, they had a really great start. And then this year you're talking about trying to tread water until you can find chemistry with some of your new centers and, and find the right line combinations. And one of the reasons why Montgomery loves to just rotate things around and and has the luxury to is because he's still got a lot of weapons that he can work with and try to figure out the best way to use them in has the luxury of being in a coaching in a game where it's a four goal lead where you can try new things so he he's had since he started a lot of those games where you're kind of testing things out tinkering and it's not life or death you have such a cushion that you try things like that in, in a game where you're leading for nothing after the first period and, and different things like that. Yeah. I was just looking at like those other teams that we've talked about of, you know, had incredible regular seasons collapse in, in the playoffs and like then went on to win the cup the next year. And obviously one was the lightning and, 1819 had that incredible regular season. Next year, you know, they get they, they get swept by the Blue Jackets that year and then win the cup the next year. Well, they went from 62 wins and 128 points. And then the next year was the COVID short season, so only 70 games. But they were 43, 21, and 6, 92 points at the time that that season, regular season was stopped. Like Good, clearly, but not nearly as dominant. If you remember, you know, the the Bruins were ahead of them in the standings when the COVID pause came. So, like, they weren't running away from anyone. The 90, the Red Wings back in 95 and 96 has another 62 win team, 131 points, lost to the Avs in the conference finals. Next, the next season, they actually, they won the Stanley Cup, their first of back-to-back Cups but they actually only had 94 points in a full 82 game regular season. Like they, I didn't look, but like they must've been pretty close to potentially missing the playoffs. Like I'm imagine they probably didn't get in by a whole lot. So clearly they weren't up that high in the standings, but um, yeah. So, I mean, it is kind of unprecedented for like a team to be that dominant, not have this playoff success. And then, like, be that dominant again, like, it, you know, I'd have to, like, dive in more and try to go back further and there's, see if there's any sort of, like, example of that. But, um, yeah, it cern- certainly they they are not they're, – they're not taking, like, a step back like those, those other teams or so far, like, pacing themselves in any way. It's like they're almost like – they're trying to, I don't know, like trying to send a message to themselves, to the league that like they're, they're still going to be there because obviously a lot of people thought they weren't going to be. So um, yeah, you know, definitely an impressive start. Do you, uh, sorry, Bridget, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think there's anything comparable Scott that you're going to find because especially considering the circumstance where, you're going from what was supposed to be the last dance and you're losing your top two centers and then coming back and being able to do, to have another amazing start for like we're projecting forward another good season. It looks like is coming for them. Um, And also dealing with the same cap issues (laughs) that they were dealing with after last season. So I feel like when you add all of that stuff in, there's just really no way to compare um, the difference in the lineup, the turnover, how important the positions were that you lost, um, and the cap tightness that they were able to comply with and be com- be this competitive. Um, it's it seems like that's kind of a unique situation. So I think that's what makes it most impressive is the the fact that 
you were trying to plug holes and you thought you were going to have to take like bargain basement, um, take what you can get situations and you add James Van Riesek, who's been great. And you add Kevin Shattenkirk, who's fit in just fine. And you find two, uh, two prospects that can jump into the lineup. And now Steen as well, like you, you've been getting play that you just were not expecting. And, and it almost was like everything at once, the development of certain players, the correct acquisitions at the right time, and just the rest of the guys being solid has created a situation that I don't think there's really much you can compare it to. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up those names because you're right. Like you have, you have 11 points in JVR. You have seven in Patra. Like, so you, you know, they're, they're two of your top five scoring forwards right now on the team and their cap hits like less than 2 million combined. Right. So um, you're right. You're right. Um, but here's my question. Uh, and this is a conversation for maybe uh, towards, towards the playoffs when it's a little bit more concrete, but Scott, I remember last year you, you, were adamant you were not a believer not a believer in the president's trophy curse so this year if the bruins are in a position to win a president's trophy which they are currently in do you want the one in the president's trophy this year scott you believe in the curse now or no they, they, they should tank they should tank the president's trophy sign sign mac jones the two-week contract Throw, throw them back. Throw them out All there. right. All right. So you, no. you're a believer now. No, I'm not. No, I, I, not. Still, I still don't believe in curses. I also, based on the same principles, do not believe in curses or magic or anything like that. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Hold on. I, I, I do believe in magic. I just want to put that in there. Oh, okay. Sorry. Not to speak for Scott. <laughs> Do you believe in ghosts? I think we had this conversation before. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you believe totally in ghosts. Believe in ghosts. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh God! All right. Well, I believe believe in magic ghosts too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott. That's 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 what we just call it a night. That's what we, Scott. Watch up behind you. <laughs> oh, okay, no, I'm just kidding. All right, we good? Anything? Anything else yeah, to talk about? I'm good. I think no, so. I we we were. This was our 200th episode was like a little spooky, a little spooky. It was <laughs> uh, easily the best one. Actually, one last, I will give a shout out to uh, friends, friends of the pod and formerly did Sunday skate together. DJ B and P Blackburn their their show. Uh, what chaos that they launched. Pretty good. Pretty funny. They've had a couple, couple Bruins interviews that people should check out with. Uh, Martian was on their first one, and then they had one drop on Tuesday with Elmark and Swayman together. Um, they, if anyone's familiar with their work or brunch or whatever, like as you can imagine, it's not a typical like hockey interview. Um, they ask very random, off-topic questions, but it's it's entertaining, and I've I've enjoyed it so far. So shout out to them. But of course, listen to the skate pod first and foremost, right, Scott? Yeah. Listen to the skate pod for your, for, you know, your real serious hockey analysis <laughs> with, with some magic ghosts uh, mixed in. And <laughs> yeah, then, was... and then listen to that to hear DJ ask uh, Jeremy Swayman about guitars and Lena Salmark about death metal. Yeah. They also had Connor Bedard on too. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's, 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 um, Quite, quite the debut for them uh, the last couple of weeks. So, yeah, there's 24 hours in a day. There's more than enough time to consume all the content. Um, so we are off until we'll be dropping an episode on Friday. Once again, that'll be a mailbag episode. So as Scott mentioned last episode, just any and all questions Bruins related, um, the, the the email, the skate pod or Twitter or YouTube uh, comments, you yeah, see it all. Yeah. So. At, at the skate pod on Twitter and email is skate pod at weei.com. And then YouTube is the, the WEI YouTube. You'll find all our podcasts in video form there. Or you could also just write a letter, um, pen and paper, and send it to Scott's address. Uh, Scott, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll put Scott's, Scott's address, address in there. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
perfect. Very good. He he like he likes the the hard the hard coffee questions. All right. Just drop it off personally. Knock on his door. <laughs> all right. So that'll wrap it up. Thank you all for listening. I'll talk to you very soon. Hey guys, thanks for watching the Skate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen. You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.